Today's video is sponsored by the new and improved Ting Mobile. So I kind of felt like I was having deja vu for my X3 review while I was testing this unit. I'm gonna go ahead and link to that video. And if you are considering picking up the GC7, I strongly recommend that you watch both. This unit has a similar feature set, similar software, similar audio performance. You just get a more expanded, like physical tactile control layout, and it's got different IO. But going through this video today, I'm left with one big question. Is there still a place in the market currently for this type of gaming centric DAC amp device. You ready? Let's go! So the Sound Blaster GC7 is a more hands-on approach to pretty much the entire catalog of Creative's audio tech, and it comes in at a retail of $169.99. For transparency, this was sent out by Creative. As always, no other compensation took place. Wouldn't affect anything I had to say about it anyway, and they didn't get to hear or see any aspect of this video before you did. Build quality here feels decent. It is all plastic. It feels more like a toy than serious gear being light, but it doesn't slide around on the desk. The front has your 3.5 millimeter jacks for both mic and headphone, as well as your indicator LEDs for source. On the rear IO, we have 3.5 millimeter line out, line in, and optical in and out as well. We also see a high low gain, a selector for aux, console, and PC, and a power switch. This is bus powered over USB C, so you won't need any kind of extra wall plug unless you're using it in a situation where you don't have USB hooked up, like you're running it over optical or you're using that aux in. On the top surface, we've got some huge logos. We also have two big dials, one for volume, one for chat mix. These have lit LED indicators and they feel really good, really smooth, no wobble at all. In between between those, we have selectors for bass, treble, surround, and super x -Fi, which the system pronounces hilariously as sex -Fi, and the mic as well, with the notched encoder controlling whichever you have activated. You also get a separate mic mute and four quick select buttons. It's worth pointing out here that pretty much everything on the surface is backlit, making it ideal for low light use. So if you are comparing it against something like the X3, which got pretty top marks from me at the time and is the easiest logical comparison, you're gaining a ton of immediate tactile control and you're gaining the optical in. You're losing the individual break out for true 7.1 surround support. The other important spec to discuss here is the power handling because the X3 claimed it could support headphones all the way up to 600 ohm. In my testing, I respectfully disagree. They also rated the power output in volts instead of watts or milliwatts, which made it tough to compare to other amps on the market. But doing the math, it was a pretty anemic power output, similar to the GSX-1000, but absolutely smoked by the $100 amp offerings from like JDS and Shit Audio. This time around, they haven't revealed any power output specs at all. Instead, they just say that it supports headphones ranging from 32 to 300 ohm. Now that leaves us to draw two possible conclusions. Number one, it might be less powerful than the X3, but number two, and probably most likely, it's the same amount of power as the X3, and they've simply dropped the claim that it can handle 600 ohm headphones. AB tested against the X3, I don't really get any notable audio performance differences, so that may be a good way to go if you're just looking to save some money. And who doesn't like saving some money, especially when it comes to something that hits every month, like your cell phone bill. That's why I've been using the new and improved Ting Mobile, the sponsor of today's video. Ting has all new plans, and their Flex plan offers unlimited talk and text starting at $10 a month, and you can pay $5 for every gig of mobile data you need. If you need a little more data, you can get 5 gig for $25 a month or 12 gig for $35 a month, and you can always top up your plan by adding $5 for every gig of rollover data. And if you really need to go big, full unlimited starts at just $45 a month with Ting. That personally saves me about $25 a month versus my regular carrier. It's really easy to switch to Ting. You just head to badctech.ting.com to check your phone, pick your plan, and Ting will send you a SIM card you can pop in your phone and get started in minutes. Plus, they've got you covered with their seriously good award-winning customer support that's available over phone, email, chat, even Discord. There's also no contracts and nationwide LTE and 5G coverage because Ting partners with huge carrier networks in the US. Maybe even the one you're currently using right now. And you can bring over your current phone, even the latest iPhone, Galaxy, and Pixel devices. To find out how much you can save and get a $25 service credit on your account, head over to badseedtech.ting.com. You can even bring over your existing phone number. Big thanks to Ting for sponsoring today and thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Creative kind of has a tendency to take in everything and the kitchen sink approach to their audio devices. And while they do kind of reference this being a mixer-like device, it's really important to state that unlike a Go XLR, you're not gonna find any support here, at least I can't, for external source mixing. There is internal mixing available if you wanna assign one PC application to like the secondary driver, like say your Discord chat, and then have your game audio on the other one. Then the 
mix knob will balance between those two internal PC sources. But like mixing the levels of your console at the same time as your PC or that aux in, I can't find any support for that. You also have the full creative software suite here as well. Despite all the access to hardware controls, this thing lives and dies by its software. And it can be overwhelming because there's just so much here. Some of it feels redundant. Some of it uses creative's own terminology. So it feels like you need a glossary. You might have questions. Like why is there a bass slider both in the acoustic engine and in the equalizer? What's the difference between acoustic engine and the equalizer? What does dialog plus mean? Luckily, the software does a good job of explaining these features. You also have complete control of not only the headphone output, but also the speaker output as well. So you have settings assigned to each output that don't affect the other unless you want them to. They have a huge list of EQ presets, many of which are custom tuned for specific games. You do have tactile control for the bass and treble at 62 hertz and 8,000 hertz. You can also take full control of all 10 bands if you like, and you can save all your custom presets as well. You can then assign those presets to one of the custom buttons where you can toggle through up to three different sound modes. These buttons are pretty flexible as you can toggle scout mode, which emphasizes high details, your mic monitoring, as well as output switching. Also media keys, application launching, text or emoji strings, and a keystroke. So they basically double as macros. You can also reassign the color of the rings as well. This unit still has the Dolby Digital encoding on board as well, though I'm not sure a lot of people are actually using it these days. If you are using it, please let me know how in the comments. I'm dying to know. And as if that's not enough, you've got their Super X5 as well. Like the X3, this requires a very cumbersome setup process where you're downloading an app to your phone, taking some pictures of your head and your ears, you're setting up an account specifically for Super X5, and finally, downloading the created profile to the GC7 itself. Sheesh. Now, I've talked at length about Super X5 before. I get what it's trying to do. The idea is that it's creating a full 360 degree sound field. I get that. The issue is to me, it just doesn't sound very good. It does accurately create the feeling that you're sitting in the middle of a bunch of speakers. It's just that they're very mediocre sounding speakers. I find this to be usable for movie watching, live music recordings, and big open world games. I do not find it particularly useful nor enjoyable for standard music recordings or competitive FPS. So the mic in has very similar performance to the X3 as well. Sounds decent. The biggest drawback here is that you're limited to mics that function over a 3.5 millimeter jack. So headset mics or add-ons like a mod mic or a boom pro. So no support here for XLR mics. And if you're using a USB mic, then you're bypassing this entire system anyway. There is support for mic monitoring or like side tone, which you can toggle on and off. The issue with this is that there is still a noticeable delay here. So you can't hear yourself in your headphones, but there is this obnoxious slight delay, even with all the mic tweaking options turned off. In terms of console performance, you will still have access to the basic onboard stuff, minus the full suite of software. So you keep your basic EQ for bass, treble, and your Super X5 modes and surround, which was actually pretty enjoyable on the PS5. Nothing really groundbreaking though, against just using something like the PC38X plugged directly into the controller. As far as the actual audio performance, I am happy to see that they restricted the audio modes to 24-bit and either 48 or 96 kilohertz. Just leave it at 2448. So this part is where you actually have to make the call about what you want and need from your audio device. If you want to primarily game and you want easy access to change and shape your sound, if you're a big believer in simulated surround or super X-Fi tech, or you use primarily easy to drive headphones or more realistically a gaming headset, this may be a one and done for you. If you're also into music listening and you want to explore some audiophile territory or perhaps use some more advanced headphones in the future, you need to look past this and go with something like an iFi Zendak or something from Fio or a Magni Modi stack. These systems will just flat out sound better and offer power levels that will drive bigger headphones, but you lose stuff like scout mode, the majority of tactile controls, surround sound. You can still, of course, EQ with third-party apps. This seems to have very similar headphone handling to the X3 as well. Certain stuff will be safe, like any gaming headset. The HD 58X is pretty solid. The K K7XX, the Maze 99 was fine. I even get ample volume level at about 60% on my DT1990. I have to say too, that there is a difference between getting a headphone to a certain volume and actually having the power to really bring that headphone to life in terms of a fuller low end, better dynamics, better detail retrieval. Like the DT1990 got loud enough just fine, but it didn't sound full. It sounded really thin and it lacked a lot of the detail that I know that headphone is capable of. The combination of DAC and amp they have at work here leans towards the high end and even gets a little bit harsh on the highs at times, pretty much regardless of the headphone. That to me lands this squarely in gaming territory. And that's a tough spot to be in with a price tag of $169.99, especially when it delivers sonically very similar to the X3 at around $40 cheaper. So is there still a place in the market for a device like this? Well, you really have to put a high premium 
on having access to tactile controls. Can't really take it serious as streaming gear with both the mixing and the mic limitations, and I can't really take it serious as audio gear when it doesn't have the audio fidelity to stack up against even similarly priced Dakam combos. I just think that there's a really specific market for this. If you want more serious streaming hardware, the Go XLR Mini can be had for like $30 more. If you want serious entry-level audio file hardware, the iFi Zendak V2, which we'll be looking at soon, goes for 10 bucks less than this, and it's impeccably well-built. If you want similar audio performance with customization for your gaming with all the software and Super XPi support, the X3 is still out there. So where do you land on this? I'd really like to hear from someone who's feeling a strong desire to purchase this unit because I need to understand the use case. As always, links down below to everything we talked about today. Any questions, hit me in the comments. And that's it for this time. I'm Brian P. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button, hit that sub button, and until next time, stay up.